Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. This is a special edition podcast. Every time we have an upcoming training phase, we do a deep dive on the pod. We tell you what is coming in the programming, why we are programming that way, and we make sure that that part of the athlete IQ, the student of the game um, portion, is possible for you guys. If everything is on purpose, it needs to start with us. Um, the things that we program for you guys need to have meaning um, so that you can sort of take that in and execute the way that you want to. Full Goon Squad in the house. Yo, Before we yo. get started, make sure you head to sharpentheaxcode.com. Use your favorite athlete code. Maybe you use the code PAGE um, because PAGE is headed to the CrossFit Games. You save 10% on your order. She gets 10% as well to aid her journey to balmy Fort Worth, Texas in August. It's going to be a hoot. You know, buy your box page. fan for hotel room. That's what this is for. <laughs> buy the Six. box fan yeah. for the hotel room. <laughs> yeah. That was actually a memory I had the other day as well, sure. Um, all of us walking out of that mall in Connecticut, maybe. Because the rooms were so... No, it was Albany. It was yeah, Albany. It was Albany because yeah. the rooms were they so... They are redoing their hotel. Air conditioning, <laughs> air conditioning broke in June. Lots of box so fans. So there's like... It's like Chatmas and you and a bunch of other people just holding box fans over their head. Um, yeah. Misfitathletics.com for Hatchet Off Season 2. That's what we're talking about today. We are getting started Monday, June 17th. So make sure you head there now. And if you're on the fence about joining us for Hatchet Off Season 2... The program preview is up and running right now. You can head in there and see the first week for free. Make sure it makes sense to you. Connect the dots between what we're talking about today. And last but not least, the greatest affiliate programming in the game, teammisfit.com. Before we get started, Cheer. we are going to do a little goon squad chitty chat. We, before the podcast, we're talking a little hockey. Um, Ted and I are participating a lot. Yes. We were really um, involved. <laughs> Hockey. Lots of opinions. Uh, fuck the Florida Panthers. Um, we'll get that out of the way. Fuck Florida um, in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if I got to watch that twat <laughs> chew on his mouth guard anymore, uh, I've had enough of Matthew Kachuk. I just, you know, I'm a Keith Kachuk fan. Turns out I'm not a Matthew Kachuk fan until he's no longer a rival of the Boston Bruins, and then I probably will be a fan. But fuck him for now. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the greatest hockey player alive, probably the most skilled hockey player ever um, that I've ever seen is on the Edmonton Oilers, and they scored that first goal and clicking through the YouTube highlights because I was running out of time, and then it was 1-1, and then it was 2-1, and then it was 3-1, and then it was 4-1, and it wasn't the Oilers that were scoring, so that was a fucking bummer. Yeah, they look good first period. I mean, it was a good back and forth. The first period was great, and... I think they flashed a headline like Edmonton was four and one or five and one after losing a game after lose or losing the first game. I think of the series, they always bounced back, but they just did not have a solution for Bobrovsky or the defense who, and Bob looked fucking suspect after that first goal. Bob Bobrovsky? First shot on, first shot on <laughs> net. They call what it Bob. His last name's Bobrovsky. <laughs> it's going to be Sharp's contribution. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Bobrovsky. Yeah. Nice. Just a next soft, soft first goal. First shot on goal like six minutes into the period and it just goes straight Trash. through him. But then <clears throat> yep. they didn't They didn't have a solution. Panthers were just all fucking over them. Yeah, I'm hoping... Uh, That's hot. The next time, <laughs> the next time <laughs> we record, it's like 2-2. Two, two. Saki series can be wild. They swing in crazy directions back and, and forth. For sure. Weren't the Oilers down 0-2 for the first two series in the conference finals, like the semifinals and the conference finals? They were in trouble, I know, a bunch, but I'm not sure exactly how that went. The Stars definitely gave them a run for their money. Yeah. Um, is this for the trophy right yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, this is the, the series? Stanley Cup final. Yeah. 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 This is basically the best team in the NHL, clearly the best team in the NHL against the best player in the NHL. And maybe... <laughs> Like the best and then the third or fourth best are on the same team. 
but yeah, they do it not sucks. Have the depth how, just or how the top heavy Edmonton is. It's almost like they're yeah. so top heavy that it brings the average like at least to the level of Florida, but Florida's just so deep. Fuck them. <laughs> Just too many, just too many, Florida. Too deep. many really good skill <laughs> players, and McJesus really like that. just needs to be fucking roast Florida a little bit harder. <laughs> I really like that Oilers logo. It's pretty dope. Yeah, they got good colors make a, too. Make a T-shirt out of it, Ted. Yeah, maybe I will. Keep the theme mm-hmm. going. Maybe I'll fuck around and find out. I would be sick. All thirty-two teams and Misfit Athletics. Oh, Hunter be so excited. <laughs> Hunter so has a excited. Misfit hockey jersey <laughs> for every we're the, team. Where the oil drop is. Florida, though. It could be the Misfit logo. Let's just say Ooh. Misfit under it. What New you got, swag gentlemen? dropping. Any code <laughs> Hunter to <laughs> buy him a box fan. <laughs> what you no. got going on, Shrebby? Nothing. Fucking nothing. I've been watching the NBA playoffs, not so much the NHL playoffs. The uh, it's funny you guys are talking about how uh, watch Conor the first like the four best. minutes before you have to go to bed. It's, that's kind of the same thing going on yeah. in the other series. Best team in the NBA is the Celtics. Maybe the yeah, best player left the best in pl- the playoffs is Luca. I mean, we might have Luca being the best player in the entire league. The way he's, he's playing, like he's just he's stupid. He just does whatever he wants. Just his sporting cast isn't good enough, and Kyrie's just shitting down his leg a little bit, which is nice to see. Him not 0 and have 13 a... at the garden since he stomped on Lucky's face. Good. Suck it, nerd. I'm just listening. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm hoping they steal one. They <clears throat> steal one in Dallas. This, uh, I think it's tomorrow's the game. They have crazy breaks during the NBA like finals. They, they during do. the every uh, all up into the uh, the finals, it's every other day you play unless you're traveling to the other place and it's two days. In the NBA finals is like a game. The next game's three weeks from now. The game after that's four months from now. It takes so fucking yeah. long. But yeah, basically the exact same thing in basketball that's going on in, in hockey. But now my uh I'd say life chat is proud father moment. I've got my kid to stand up. If he has to fart, point his butt at someone and fart at them, which was just <laughs> so great yesterday. How did he I know? Up. He was sitting on the couch a theme to that. <laughs> watching a show with us. He gets up, turns around, points his butt directly at Noel and goes <laughs> and then starts laughing. And it's just oh it's so great. Yeah, my proudest moment to date. <laughs> How long have you proud? been training him for that? It's birth. <laughs> Four years. <laughs> it was so good. I'm fucking dying. Noel's offended. It stinks in the house. It's it's amazing. Everything you could ever want. <laughs> Anything else, gentlemen? Office? If a small child pointed his ass at me and fucking ripped ass, I oh, would. I'm, I'm getting I don't know. Over. I, I, there's a there's a decent chance that kid gets drop kicked. Like, high fived. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, gonna, yeah high fived with a fist straight to his taint. <laughs> God damn it, Ted. No, sure. Keep your get hands away from my kid's taint. <laughs> Jeez, Keep your kid's ass You're away fucking... from me. <laughs> uh I don't have a lot going on, but I did receive a compliment from Hunter on the new shirts, which is like the first time he's ever liked anything that we've ever made. Dear 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 well, except for that fair, one Heather Gray I didn't know if it liked. was you or Drew, so I just said good job. Oh, so <laughs> if, if you I knew knew it, was it was you, me? I might not have oh, said okay. no, Gotcha. Sure. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, this thing's gotcha. sick. I'm only sending you small. Is the suffer from now on. is the suffer one inspired by anything? I'm assuming the blue is Nirvana and this one's the Obviously, the Kings. Um, no, the blue one's not Nirvana. Oh, okay, I think got that it. Is no joke. <laughs> <laughs> I drew uh, those. I drew those horns and deleted the tongue. Um, so you know, twice maybe did it twice yeah. in Photoshop. And nice. then I finesse the horns a little bit just before the final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean that's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the suffer's <laughs> not. is done. The suffer one's not Dead. like inspired by anything specific. It's just kind of like a design style that you see sometimes on on different shirts just kind of a simple i don't know yeah i thought it looked cool uh, had a little three t-shirt goodie bag on my desk and saw the as soon as i saw like the i only saw like the upper half i was like is that an la kings like (laughs) shirt yeah we can we can give the credit for that idea to uh ryan ryan pie He's yeah. uh, a dragon dagger. dagger, the the guy that shoots with us. He sent me a message one night. He was like, I think this would look cool as a Misfit logo. I was like, mm, consider it done. It does. Well, Turns confirmed. Out it did. Confirmed yeah. cool. Well, you can also have your own three t-shirt goodie bag if you head to sharpentheaxco.com. Uh, tomorrow Get your goodie bag. today, depending on when you're listening to this, Wednesday, June 12th. Yeah. And use the code hunter, get a free box fan. Use the code <laughs> hunter um, when it's sold out so that your 0% discount is on $0. <laughs>
You will get that discount. <laughs> <laughs> I will guarantee that you'll get like zero. Code Hunter off adds ten percent to your order. Oh yeah, that's right. That's yeah. still what it does. It but you said you had to give him a, a note. What? If you use code Hunter, it adds ten percent, but he'll write you a note. That's Ooh. right. That is what it is. I yep. think I've sent one handwritten note. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hatchet Done podcasting. Off season two. <laughs> oh, All right. Podcast. Good podcast. Off, to you guys. Okay. All right. I want to start with a hatchet off season one wrap up. Um, I'm hoping that, and I know that this is the case for certain athletes because of Discord, but I'm hoping that athletes notice the progressions throughout. Um, there were lifting progressions, there were bitch work progressions, and one uh, kind of secret of the pros and something that we do for all of our remote coaching clients is recognizing your chances to make the small growth in a certain thing. So if it's a max rep set, you're going for another rep. We're back in fourth gear again, you know, on the rower, can I knock a second off? And I think a lot of people get a little bit of that goldfish brain when it comes to the program. Um, so the athletes that do notice and do put in discord, I don't think it's a coincidence that they know that they're comparing it to a previous lifting session and that they got more reps. Um, so making sure that you're taking your notes at this point in the year, um, because we get a long ways to go. It's a long off season, um, before we get to competition again. So make sure you're paying close attention to when things repeat or are similar so you can actually see your progress. And then one thing that I intentionally didn't tell anyone um, on the podcast for off season one is all of your build bitch work, all of your anaerobic bitch work was either fourth or fifth gear. So we only worked one, two, three, four, five. Um, and that was very intentional to drive home the point that you go slow to go fast. So we have all of that. You mean aerobic? The anaerobic? Uh, no. Uh, fourth and fifth are anaerobic. One, two, three are aerobic. So, oh, okay. so basically we did zone two work in first through fifth gear. So no six, no seven, no eight. Um, and we knocked the volume down a little bit and made it very doable for you guys to go into pieces and really dig into being able to hold paces um, that were a little bit slower in a longer duration. So you'd be able to, to kind of turn the heat up a little bit in OS2. We have a, a much more wide range of the gears, but I'm hoping that people dug into that, especially the people on the conditioning track, so they can realize that your ability to stomp the gas pedal um, and sustain that has a lot to do with, you know, doing your zone two work and staying at the right heart rate and then working, you know, your first through fifth gear. Yeah, I think it's also a good um, kind of reminder that there are lots of different ways to measure progress. Combination of the obvious ones being like, did I go faster? Did I, you know, get more rounds or reps on the AMRAP? Or did I lift heavier? Did my one rep max go up? Those are the big ones. Those are the things that most people think of when they think like, yes, I'm getting better. But especially this time of year, things like it feels better. I'm more comfortable breathing yeah. on a machine. I'm getting more comfortable, uh, you know, transitioning from movement to movement or my lifts are, you know, I've, I've pulled some weight off the tempo pull squat snatch work, uh, is making my snatch feel better. Maybe the number hasn't gone up just yet, but you have to keep in mind, like the odds that you're doing a one rep max on the exact day where things fall perfectly in line with what your capabilities actually are is way lower than the odds that you identify progress made in a tempo snatch session where you're like, damn, those lifts felt good because ultimately this is the time of year where we're trying to build repeatable movement patterns, um, not grind through dog shit, dog shit reps. And the longer you've been in the sport or just training in general, it becomes even more important to pay attention to those smaller, seemingly less significant wins. Uh, because the the PRs are going to come fewer and fewer between, um, fewer and farther between, as as you just kind of the winds are the fuel to keep going, right? If you can recognize more of those, I mean, you talk to any high level competitor about their training, they pay attention to things that you've probably never thought of. That's really what it comes down to, and that's sort of what allows them to realize that <clears throat> they are still getting better despite bar numbers not changing instantaneously. Like 
when everyone comes to the gym and they're like, I haven't PR'd in a while. I'm like, congratulations, you're not a beginner anymore. Good job. Keep showing up. We'll eventually get you better. You just get to keep plugging away and plugging away. And the hard part is recognizing the wins that aren't as objective, you know, relative to the subjective ones. One important and kind of fascinating barrier to entry when it comes to progress can be stepping over that line of, I don't fucking hate this anymore. Like that's what popped into my head with what Hunter said is like, okay, I'm feeling more comfortable. We create these negative associations with movements or machines or, you know, we joke inanimate objects. Don't give a fuck about you. The jump rope will stay in the corner and be dusty and do absolutely nothing. So it's kind of weird that you have a, f- a vendetta against, you know, a plastic handle and a, and a shit to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. God. but once we cross Sorry. that threshold then you can actually start to get better because like you could have the you, say have the leverage and the power output and all of these different things in your bag to be able to say be good on the rower or the echo bike but you kind of panic as you go through it and we see this at, at competitions as well athletes you could have the exact same athlete in their headspace related to what's going on whether it's the nerves of a competition or how challenging a specific movement is, you have one athlete in 10th and one athlete in 30th. And before the competition, if you didn't know them very well, you'd be like, how is this possible? And it's like these positive associations that people make, um, people that push back against resistance can really make a change in what's happening. Because you know we alluded to it in our, our last podcast, the semifinals was nuts. The, the fitness level right now is so high. So what are the intangibles? What are the small things that you can figure out? And when we give you guys more manageable volume, not just across the board, but in a particular piece at this point in the off season, we're trying to figure out what those intangibles can be. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Strength bias versus continue, uh, continuing bias, conditioning bias continued. Um, another nod to semifinals. I believe that the least correlated event to success at semifinals based on absolutely no data in just my brain and watching was event five, the snatch event. You couldn't really tell the difference in the heats for the most part. Um, you could tell the difference a little bit in body language, but it's kind of funny when an athlete's like not gassed at all. They just aren't quite ready to lift the weight again. So that might have been one of the nuances of of what I'm talking about. So we just had seven weeks of strength or conditioning bias. You were choosing as an athlete in off season one. If you're new to the program, if you're thinking about joining, um, basically what we're looking at is every single athlete will cross over on one strength piece and one conditioning piece. But then if you choose the strength bias, you move up to two strength pieces a day. And if you choose the conditioning bias, you move up to two conditioning pieces a day. Um, and while those sound like subtle differences, um, there is there is a pretty huge difference in you know two lifts and a conditioning over the course of five days a week for seven weeks versus the opposite. Um, and I don't bring that up to say that no one should choose the strength bias, right? Like we're we're really far away from the season, and if you want to continue that, and you're really trying to get into um, you know, making changes within your strength, within the movements, the way that you actually move, I think it's great that you continue on if that's what you should do. But I, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know if this is a, a, a direction that they want to head into. They're giving off the vibe that that's the case. It was very simple this year. It was very straightforward. It was very conditioning, CrossFit. Even the lifting was very much like you your GPP level needs to be real fucking high um, inside of the lifting events. So if you're on the fence, there's a really good chance that you should choose the conditioning bias. Yeah, personally, I think that's the better application of the kind of fitness they want to see within an an elite level CrossFitter. It's obviously nice to have the showcase to watch the max lift and to obviously it's something you have to train for year round in case you get put in a situation where you need to maximize the weight in the barbell. But I mean, I look at that snatch event and I think that's quintessential CrossFit. It's a chance for you to demonstrate how strong you are, but also how efficient you move. And, you know, you take the charter of mechanics, consistency, intensity, and you apply it at the highest level. That's what it looks like is that snatch ladder. For sure. Um, so 
you get that choice. There are instructions every single day. There's instructions for strength bias, conditioning bias, and then we what we call an open athlete. Open athletes coming into the gym, they're hitting a lift, they're hitting a conditioning, they're done. There are scaling options, there are equipment modifications under Hatchet. So you guys have the opportunity to come in, to join the community, to communicate on Discord and just have these subtle differences. You know, your thrusters 95 instead of 115, you know, there's there's less muscle ups or there's, you know, chest to bar instead, that sort of thing. So those are the instructions that you'll see daily going into it. Um here, I, I got a question for the group yeah. on, and to play a little bit of devil's advocate, because I generally agree, you know, most, well, I think we, I think maybe I asked the question a, a couple of podcasts ago, like what percentage of athletes should maybe be on the strength track versus the conditioning track. Mm-hmm. But it's <clears throat> the argument for the conditioning track from our side is crossfit is a conditioning sport like at the end of the day maybe having a one rep max is like a good one rep max is cool for like three percent of the time statistically because that the odds that 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 specific lift gets tested in a manner that allows you to show off your strength is pretty low and will always be offset by a dose of conditioning that kind of balances the scales but there is, and there's all, there always will be kind of a minimum barrier to entry as far as strength goes. You know, Fran at 95 pounds for someone with a 300 pound back squat is not Fran at 95 pounds it for sucks. someone with a 400 pound back squat. You, you talk about that a lot, Drew. So what yep. is the line? And maybe it's an objective number or maybe it's just a general, you know, explanation. But what is the line where, to, where I say like, uh, yeah, my my conditioning or more eggs put into the strength basket will move the needle further for me than the conditioning. I got an idea. Who, who's that Go for? Ahead, look at your ranking in 24.1 and look at your ranking in 24.3. Refine everybody what those workouts were right quick. So the first one is the snatch and burpee over the dumbbell with a repeated you know, arm over okay. and over again for yep. 21 reps. And the final one was the thruster uh, pull-up, thruster bar muscle-up, right? If you look at those two scores and you hammered, hammer, hammered the first one, but you didn't so, do so good on, on the third one, 24.3, you probably have a decent hole in your strength because for a lot of athletes, the limiting factor was their ability to cycle that 135 barbell. Now, of course, this is just one measurement, but if you crushed 24.1, you obviously have a very, very good engine. Why wasn't that engine showcased in 24.3? Probably because you, were, you have a pretty good lack in your strength. I would argue that there are the unicorns of people that the reason they didn't do well on that is because they're really, really strong, just terrible bar muscle ups is significantly smaller than the group that is really, really conditioned, but not strong enough to move that barbell 135 fast enough. So those scores are at odds with one another. It's like this person clearly has a great engine, but they aren't very strong. Here's the showcase of that. I mean, you know, using yourself as an example, Hunter, you smashed the first one and did only so so on the last one relative to what I thought your fitness was. And that's because that 135 barbell is a pain in the dick at that and at that yep. late shirt in the juncture of the workout so it's you know that could be a measurement someone could use and be like all right objectively in the world that was this place in 24.1 and much lower in 24.3 there's a good reason to do the strength track i'm clearly missing some element of strength in this workout again there are more than one metric to use but that's an easy one i can think of yeah i like um i like starting with strength to body weight ratio when we have this conversation because gpp is a fascinating topic and i think I think people don't understand that bringing up your inefficiencies in any of these categories we're talking about um, will do the most for your GPP. So like someone who needs to get stronger needs to get fucking stronger or they're not going to be able to use it in this sport. We all remember those benchmarks like a DT, even like a Fran because of how much power output is associated with that, where when you weren't as strong, they sucked. You didn't just didn't get to use your fitness. Um, And if you are a bigger athlete who struggles with strength numbers, um, we need to bring up that GPP and get that metabolic conditioning to a place where you can express your, you know, sort of mass moves mass equation on a barbell. There are people who, especially the way that we program, we have a lot of, you'll hear us say volume bias. We get a lot of strength movements where we ask an athlete to move the weight quite a few times. Um, so I like to start there because if an athlete 
is has a good strength to body weight ratio, but aren't that strong, they're always going to be on that strength track for me throughout most of the season. Um, good and, strength to body weight ratio, but aren't strong compared to the field. Exactly. Is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I do like to start there and it's, and sometimes it's not even about like, we can get an athlete fitter. That's a little bit bigger that, um, we don't need them to lose a bunch of weight, right? We need to, to manipulate their energy systems and a lot of times get their, you know, aerobic base in there. And, and maybe they just, you know, sort of naturally live in that 205 to 215 range based on height or bone structure or whatever it is. Um, red hair or whatever <laughs> fuck yourself so i like i like that and then i mean it goes without saying we've been talking about this for a long time we have a ton of youtube content associated with it if you move like dog shit in any equation either do the conditioning track or the open track so that you can spend like 15 minutes with an empty barbell warming up to do a movement right if we if we move like crap and then we do a bunch of movements it's one of those things where you're like a couple steps forward, 16 steps back, 26 steps forward, 4,000. Like you're all over the place with your movement, with the way that you're going, because you could get yourself a little bit stronger. But then like we joke about it when we, we always program phase two always has push press in it. If there's no skill transfer, like if you move like, like absolute dog shit in a push press and there's no trans skill transfer to a push jerk or a pressing movement. It's this like Boy. weird heaving, standing bench press kind of thing. A handstand push up. There's no yeah. point in doing it, right? So, so we have, you know, I look over at my boards and it's like, okay, we do have 10 movements here in every single phase that you could use to get stronger. But if you're not moving well, like it's got to be five. We have to chop it in half and just learn how to move because there's that, that is like an ultimate barrier to entry. That is like, you know, I'm on this side and I can't get over to the other side and I will never get stronger or reach my potential if I don't move well. Yeah, I don't so, even know if I consider that a strength versus conditioning bias necessity. That's like, you need a fucking coach. You need to yeah. go to a CrossFit gym that knows yep. how to teach and right. see and correct. Before, to, not to go too long on this topic, but do you have like a number when, you, when you're saying strength to body weight ratio? If you have like a lift that like, it's like I want so-and-so to be a, like two and a half X body weight back squat, for example, or something like that. Do you have a specific um, lift that you use for that? Or I, I, I don't because we could be talking about someone coming to us that wants to qualify for the CrossFit games, semifinals, quarterfinals, you know, gym's backyard, bonanza, throwdown. Like, yeah. like I need to know that. And then once I have context, I can create those numbers, right? I can go in and be like, we got to snatch. You know, I might be saying we got to snatch 185 up to 275, right? Like that's sure. how big that gap could be. But we can, once we create brackets for an athlete for a season, I think this is incredibly important for every single person to do. Like what's your goal for the season? What's the ceiling? I want to be top 20 at semifinals. You and your coach and your, you know, your circle, your bubble need to figure out if that's doable. And if it is, it's pretty clear what you need to be able to accomplish on most of the like athlete IQ checklist that we do in phase zero every year. You need to be able to lift this much. You need to be yeah. able to, to go run a, you know, a 10 K at this pace, that sort of thing. So once we get the goals and they make sense, then it's like, okay, what, what do we need to actually accomplish here? And that will inform a ton of stuff, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, okay, this person, your, your goals track on, I need a 185 snatch out of you. And they're like, well, I snatched 225. It's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. What's your, you know, 5K run? And they say 30 minutes. And it's like, okay, well, I think we know <laughs> what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's one thing where we could make a little graph or like a little cheat sheet for people and put it on Instagram and be like, if you're this, then you need to do this um, and see how many likes we could get. But I don't think anyone in this podcast would believe that it was like a catch-all for the right athletes. Do you guys yeah, remember those back in the broad. day? Back in the day, there used to be like, if, if you're going to be on, you know, fucking team comp train or whatever the fuck Hacks it is, you need to have a 
three you need like a three second fran you need to be able to do 80 muscle ups in a row and there were yeah. just these crazy numbers across the board and it's like fuck i'm, I'm gonna go win the crossfit games if I'm doing <laughs> everything on this list well, i think those things like are and they were they pro they were valuable at the time that they were published right and that that's because like you could be somebody with holes in certain areas of your fitness but be exceptional in other areas and that would carry you you know like that would carry you far enough into a competition or to the level that you wanted but you kind of mentioned it at semifinals this year it's like when there's a when there's a it's an eight second gap between first and 20th place it's like what fucking chart is going to tell me what yeah. strength to body weight ratio those charts are the reason why we started misfit athletics Things like that. This yeah. is the program. This is exactly what you need to do. This is what every person in the entire community, regardless of athlete, age, and skill level, and blah, blah, blah. It was like, we can't, I can't go follow a program. How the fuck is the program the same for me as it is for Sherb? Hey, How are Sherb and I on the same fucking program? I don't understand. It doesn't I make sense. I just send you guys so. the list in the chat. You, oh, you have it? <laughs> I found it, yeah. Someone copied and pasted it into Cross It Incendia's. I don't know. I wonder if they're still crazy. Nah, they're not. They're not. No, they're not longer. anymore. They were back then. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> what's it? What's the? What's it for? Oh, here. bro, you want What be... the fuck? What is with the 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 the, the bench press being so high? You only need to snatch two thirty five. This 30 is sure. This is this is this is this is our year, sure. This is for what the fuck? Uh, this was based on twenty thirteen going into twenty fourteen. Yeah, I definitely Tell you what, had, um, your boy did not You'd be able to do seven muscle ups. <laughs> All right, let's, I'm going to see if one of these I can do. Fran, maybe. Helen, no. Fight gone bad, probably not. Diane, Can't yes. do a 230 Fran, sure. Loser. Maybe. You're talking about 2014 guy. Suck me. <laughs> not now. Oh, you now I can done. do it. 239. Uh, <laughs> snatch, maybe. Do, uh, Clean jerk, probably not. Front squat, maybe. Deadlift, yes. Overhead squat, maybe. Bench press, definitely not. <laughs> muscle up, five strict no. muscle ups, bro. Strict, can't give me muscle up. Five's a lot, guy. Maybe, maybe. I doubt it. Maybe though. Twenty bar muscle ups, probably not. <laughs> strict pull up, definitely not. Butterfly pull up, maybe. Weighted pull up, no. <laughs> Dips, maybe. Everything's a fucking Wait. maybe or a no. And then you get the that's conditioning a body and weight, laugh. weighted pull up. You're supposed to do a hundred of them. No, no, <laughs> no. no. Weight, weight of the pull up, one hundred oh, okay. lbs. Pound. I like the uh, 530 mile, pull definitely not. 5K run, ouch. Not that crazy, love, but still I ouch. I love that, that 400 meter run in association with some of these other things. It's great. <laughs> Very nice. That looks like 60 this minute is... row. Boy, this looks so fun. Right? Fucking A, minimum standards just a few weeks after you won the team division of the 2012 games. At this weekend's regionals. First place at seven events, you... Also at a second team, I guess. Wow. Okay, that's amazing. It's stuff. What could Tommy that's do? Good. That's the, that's the name of the list. What could Tommy do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to be able to do everything that I can do. Yeah, three twenty-five bench press. A goddamn three twenty-five bench press, but a three fifteen overhead squat. What the fuck? My favorite is the snatch. Two thirty-five. Two thirty-five snatch. snatch three twenty-five. <laughs> just jumbled up the numbers a bit for the bench press. That's all. Fuck. Damn. Oh man, it's that's funny. All right, um, moving on. The way that we do skill during the off season is we give you guys um, five progressions. There are five choices, and we're basically telling you to choose up to three of them. And you would choose those week one. You would choose them like you're listening to this podcast. You write down what we say, or you download the guide that we're going to put in Discord. Um, and you choose up to three of these progressions. We want you to lock in on them. Um, if you're working on all five, all like all the time in every single phase, then you're working on nothing. Basically, like we need you to take the time to to really dig into something specific. And our list is rope climbs, strict handstand push-ups. With the strict handstand push-up, you have the choice of wall facing or traditional. Um, we find that there's quite a bit of nuance within whether you like one or the other. And it seems to be the kind of thing where until the community gets enough exposure to the wall facing and figures them out, 
there's not always the strongest correlation between the two. Like we've definitely seen athletes that love strict handstand push-ups struggle a little bit with the wall facing. So we want you to choose one of those if you're going to work on them and stick with it for the seven weeks. We're going to alternate back and forth again with the bar muscle up and chest to bar, um, handstand walking, and then ring muscle ups. Um, and one of the discussions that Hunter and I had um, was actually related to the rope climb progression specifically. And a conversation that you've heard us have on the podcast before with all of us having a more traditional sports background is whether we practice or not in this sport. Because it, like, you don't play a football game or a hockey game or a basketball game at practice every single day, right? But in CrossFit, yep. it's like 21, 15, 9, 21, 15, 9, five rounds, AMRAP, whatever it is. Like, we do a lot of, you know, sort of game speed work um, on a day to day basis. And one of the ways that every single person on this podcast and probably everyone who ever had a good coach that's listening, they got better at things was repetition in an environment where things were really singled out and you got to just practice and then practice and then practice. So with the rope climbs, um, basically Hunter was just checking in on like, did you mean to make it this soft? <laughs> this softer than puppy shit or what? Fuck and man. the answer was yes, because I want deliberate practice very specifically. I want athletes to be able to practice their rope climbs. And if I'm rushing to get up the rope, then I am essentially practicing fitness once again, something that we're doing all the time. Um, sure. Have you, have you looked at this? Do you have, a, have an opinion on... Um, I'll read you week one every 15 seconds until you reach nine, ro nine reps, one rope climb. Rest one minute if you fail to complete the rep inside of 15 seconds. Um, five minute time cap. So not like stupidly easy. Like you do a rope climb, you come back down, you're going to jump up. Still at four seconds. reps in a minute. It's not sure. Yeah. It nothing. reminds me of that uh, muscle up imam from dot com years ago that everyone was like, oh, that's fucking stupid. One every 20 seconds. That's not hard. And then they got like three minutes into it and they're like, couldn't fucking yeah. do it anymore. Yeah. It's exactly like and that. We go 9, 10, 11, 12. Like we climb as we go. But I think, um, like if this was written for me, I'd probably, honestly, would probably need 20, 25 seconds as we got like further in if I was actually going to practice rope climbs. Like if I was going to think about like, I'm normally like a small jump and a two pull rope climb person. And I would say that if I did a Metcon with 10 rope climbs in them, four of them would have two very technically sound pulls based on like my heart rate. So if I wanted to practice this movement and really think about standing up and keeping my hands low and then bringing them high, um, I need a little bit more time to be able to do that. Could I just bastardize the movement and get this done? Probably. Um, but again, this idea of practice that's missing from a lot of places within the sport of CrossFit um, is, is something that I think is, is super important. You know, that's a to, great for place for a kid to, to learn how to ride a bike at the top of a giant hill. That's the best place to learn how to do something. The top giant hill, like, good luck, kid. Fucking it's the, pick it's that meme. On the mountain. It's that yeah. meme where it's like the straight downhill into the pier. Yeah, good luck. That's how I taught my sister off. how to ride a no, bike. Of course not. You got to slow down. I put her on top of a right. bike on the hill that, that in, the back, checks out in our too. backyard. And I just push her down. <laughs> she made it. I mean, she made oh, it she to did. the flat and crashed. I, ran I tell you guys a story that I told my dad that my brother died on his bike. <laughs> um, we had this huge. We had this huge. <laughs> Hatchet OS2, uh, side note, um, we had this huge sand pit, like probably roughly a 400 meter run through the woods from our house growing up. Um, Ted, I'm sure you oh, remember yeah. the sand oh, pit yeah. out behind Beach Ridge. Um, and you weren't indoctrinated into the like the club of kids, like the kind of kid who would have like a switchblade. You guys remember those kids? They were like a flannel in the summer. Yeah, I saw them. Your parents did. never knew where the fuck they were. You weren't in that group unless you rode your bike down the back of the pit, which was short, but basically straight down. Nice. So my brother, I'm like a hundred yards away and he start takes off down the hill and falls <laughs> off the back of the bike, which I don't even know physics wise how that's possible. 
Must have had a strong he lean going into it. He was doing a wheelie. And the kid at the top screams, oh my God, he's dead. <laughs> and I was, oh. I, I was probably like 10. Well, so I ran gotta home. Be true. I ran home immediately. I did not check on my brother. I ran home, got my dad, and said, Matt's <laughs> dead. Oh my God. I was just. I can't imagine Claire took that anything but level headed. Just, relay, just relaying the news from so the my Switchblade dad, kid. Got it. Um. <laughs> Eat your heart out. Tommy Hackenbrock runs a 57 second 400 um, and definitely tripped over a root at some point. That was kind of one of his go-tos. When he was pissed and he ran, he always fell, um, which God was super it, entertaining Claire. as a child. And he gets out there footwork. and Matt is <laughs> completely fine. <laughs> like he was sitting there and he'd like knocked the wind out of himself and like had a little like, you know, like spit and dirt on his mouth, you know, that kind of thing. Honestly, he knowing him, he might have had that already. <laughs> but like... Yeah, so that happened. I told my my dad that my brother was dead. Um, good stuff. So, don't don't fall off the back of a bike. Um, that's He's the, dead. The top of the rope. Of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Where were we? Rope climbs. He's dead. Rope climbs. Practice your rope climbs. Yeah, Go practice slow. from not the top of the sand pit. Correct. Why yes. Not? Don't start your rope climbs at the top and fall off onto your back. Um. Okay, so again, those are the skill progressions. Same day, every single week, very off-season, kind of friendly, obvious progressions week to week. Choose up to three of those, lock in on them, make some progress. Um, surprise, surprise, we are still running and biking as a bias. Get out um, of here. Off-season, off-season kind of thing, uh, summer um, vibes to it. Take the C2 bike outside running is as we you know waxed on and on about in the off season one podcast the ultimate expression of fitness and i just really felt like the combination of aerobic and anaerobic bias with the zone two stuff athletes could have a very different engine um over the course of 14 weeks if they just bought into it like we see it at the affiliate level the change in an athlete from that like first test to then you're starting to see, you know, that whether it's 400s, 500s, 800s, mile repeats within the gym. Um, and they're not leaning into that bias at anywhere near the rate of what we're doing on the website. So it's just the kind of thing where we know that you can make that progress there and kind of a segue just into the conditioning bias. Um, the power of if you really did. So week one, day one, we start with, if you're on the conditioning bias track, you've got a zone two run, and then you have an opportunity on the rest day to work on your weakest C2 machine. If you did 14 weeks of the zone two running and stayed on a machine or did the seven and seven, broke the machines up a little bit, just that alone would make such a huge difference. And I know that that's challenging when you see the same thing repeated when it's summertime and People typically are taking, you know, more weekends off or vacations, that sort of thing. But those are the things that athletes buy into. And then you ask, how the fuck did they jump as far up the leaderboard as they did? And it's simple shit like that. Executed they trained over more and over and over. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> I know. And then the obviously answer. a second conditioning piece, a second <laughs> Metcon a day, like two Metcons a day for 14 weeks. You gonna get fitter? A lot more. Sounds dangerous. <laughs> would you tell, yeah, would you have an athlete or would an athlete, it says, so MF2 or zone two, any C2 machine, would you mm -hmm. be averse to letting somebody run a second MF2 session? Is it more just a impact and kind of body like, but. Um, so I actually have sort of remote thing? clients doing that currently, but I swap out the, I swap out an aerobic session on a training day i personally don't love running on rest days for athletes that are not good at running like when fucking yeah, just you too know much ryan, energy. ryan mckay takes off down the road on a rest day i don't really care i think he'll be fine um yeah. even though we tell him not to and he does it anyways what's up ryan um, should try barbell <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so fucking death march death march for 45 minutes 
if you really struggle with running and you're just unable, your paces are all over the place, you don't understand how to pace when it comes to this stuff. If you saw an aerobic bike workout, an aerobic whatever, um, you know, on day three is typically where that's going to pop up and you wanted to swap in a second zone to run, I would say absolutely. Um, I am always careful to throw in this like tiny anecdote um, of what we do in remote coaching because like looking at week one, day three, we've got high rep double unders that same day. We've got a bunch of box jump overs the day before. Um, we've got a long run later in the week. Those are the kinds of things where the remote coach is looking specifically at the entire picture. Um, so you guys get to see your week in advance. Be smart. Don't ruin your feet. <laughs> but yes, long story long, second day of zone two running is being delivered to quite a few people currently. Beautiful. Enjoy your fitness, okay. idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Back squat progression, um, tried and true. We start with the high rep. If you followed off season one, um, then you got yourself a, a lovely dose of 12s and 10s and 8s. And people have been crying and rejoicing simultaneously in Discord about how they're feeling about those sets. Um, right. Now we go into Texas method. You have right. your weekly five rep max and then five by five at 90 percent of your five rep max before you go ask in discord how the fuck am i supposed to do five by five at 90 percent read the instructions it's of your five rep max um and if you can do five by five at 90 percent, please stay on the strength bias track until you cannot <laughs> um and then we go into heavy as fuck in phase one so we're building we're we're really leaning into something similar to that starting strength vibe. We're going to get your legs under you with a bunch of reps. We're going to kind of bounce back and forth, honestly, between heavy and volume bias. Five rep max is obviously very heavy. And then five by five and 90% of that has a twinkle of, of volume into it. And then we get into, you know, sort of getting your one rep max ready. And honestly, we've had years where we've mixed it up a little bit and people weren't as strong. Nope. Um, and it's like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. This works really fucking well. Um, if you're just listening to this podcast as a Larry, you're not a competitor. You do not follow our programming. You want to get your back squat better for seven to nine weeks, do high rep back squats for seven to nine weeks, do the Texas method. And then for seven to nine weeks, do a peaking phase and you will be stronger in your back squat than you've ever been in your entire life. And more handsome. That is true. Okay. <laughs> it's true. That Texas fact. method back squat has never not worked. I'm still waiting for the day right. that it doesn't work for me, and it still hasn't happened, we'll which is it sad right because it works. It's just so goddamn miserable. There's Boy. there's something sold. so special about the five by five. <laughs> yeah, day. yeah. I'm fucking yeah. sold on her. Thanks. <laughs> you're welcome. You'll feel yeah, like you've prolapsed. Head to Misfit Athletics. But you'll get really yeah, strong. You're gonna hate yourself. You're gonna be tired. You're gonna be sore. Oh. You're gonna be strong as fuck. Sorry. Here's one of the reasons why I love it so much. If you're weak and you do this, you get stronger, right? So you do your five rep max and you're trying nice. to find out what you can do for five reps. And then you do your five by five and you get your legs under you, as I like to say. But then the fast twitch athlete, somebody like me, when I'm going to do a one rep max, the question always was, can I catch the bounce? Am I going to be in optimal positioning? Am I going to get a good stretch reflex and stand this weight up? And it always looked exactly the same until the last, you know, six inches of standing up. And then it was, you know, did I have enough momentum from that position? The best thing that I ever did leading into trying to make my one rep max go up was logging the reps through the positions and not relying on catching the bounce within the five by five. That, that enhanced uh, what is the word I'm trying to think of? Um, changed my one rep max more than always just diving into fucking whatever it was, small of, or trying to figure out the volume back squat cycle and that sort of thing. So if we can check both of those boxes with one program, um, then it's this pretty special stimulus. A lot of times we're, you know, kind of leaning a little bit towards, 
you know, helping one athlete over the other a little bit more than the other. This one to me, like when I see both sides of like slow twitch athlete, okay, you need to squat fast twitch athlete. You probably need to get a few more reps under your belt so that you have some of the supporting musculature. So that's one of the reasons why it's like such a no brainer to, to put that in. The double edged sword that, that is using the bounce is can obviously let you show off, but for a long time is a is a like a mask for how bad you're strong you actually strong are through the middle of your squat. And like for a lot of athletes they rely on that. Oh, it's fucking trash. Why, why why randomly one day they have <laughs> you don't this want it, thirty pound PR. Like and then they can't repeat it yeah. ever. It's like I know why. Yeah. Yeah. You don't you haven't earned that position. You haven't claimed strength through that range of motion. And that is why you have this random weird PR that you've never touched again. And people in your gym think that you're going to crush a Metcon because it's got heavy front squats in it. And it's like, well, there's 35 of them. I'm coming in last, even though <laughs> I can front squat more than anyone in the gym. <laughs> it's not that cool. It's not that fun. <clears throat> Would have been cool back in the day, though, with that fucking list. I checked a lot of those boxes. There, was no, there, there wasn't that much fitness on that list. Um, all right. Tempo pull clean. We love the fucking tempo pull. Olympic weight lifts, baby. Um, we spent seven like weeks. Filming them. <laughs> no, that's, that's we spent seven weeks on the tempo pull snatch. You can't figure out how to get the barbell through the right positions. First pull, second pull, third pull. Slow down. So we just did that for seven weeks with the snatch. We're going to do it with the clean now. It's just another one of these things that works do it. really well. Um, I don't know if you guys want to talk about it at all, but it just works. You go very you do slow it at the right speed. The you get really good at it. Our position. Yeah. You go at the right speed. You get really good at it. But that requires you to set your ego aside and go a lot lighter and a lot slower than you think you need to go. Most people are like I'm going slow, coach, and still move poorly. So there's plenty of videos there on how to do it correctly go slower than you think you should and go lighter than you think you should. Yeah, I mean, balance through the foot and ass up in the first pull. Like, you avoid the... You, you have to avoid those things in the tempo pull. It's, like, not possible. Even for sure. Even with Sherb Watch being able shirt. to fold in half like a fucking lawn chair and has basically only hamstrings. His hamstrings oh, actually with... weigh 204 and the rest of his body weighs one pound. <laughs> Um, true. <laughs> fuck. He, I, I mean, even it, he can't do the tempo pull clean or snatch with his keister up in the air and maintain balance through his foot. Yeah, I think the the common commonality between the tempo pull clean stuff and what you were just talking about with the back squat, I, and I think a lot of athletes associate like, oh, the skill or moving, like I need to move better or my, you know, technique needs to improve with the more technical lifts like the clean or the snatch. But the back, like the same thing applies to a deadlift or a back squat and a back squat, I would argue, especially just given how the crossover that it has within all the other movements of the sport, but um, learning and it's the same idea when you were talking about using, you know, balance through your entire foot it's not just balance through your entire foot for the sake of balance. When you are balanced over your foot correctly, you are ensuring that you're engaging the correct musculature. And for most CrossFitters, or I, most, especially at the affiliate level, it gets probably better the more advanced they get. But CrossFitters' ability to use their ass and their hamstrings is some of the worst in all of sport like ever historically it's not a comfortable thing athletes don't like hinging at the waist and hanging kind of on glutes and hamstrings and especially if you never played sports or even if you did like you unless you were trained unless you had a good coach or were trained specifically in it the idea of using the largest muscles in your bodies the glutes and hamstrings just never really like it's just probably not something that you did. And most CrossFitters are more comfortable squatting through kind of their quads. The problem with that is, is that one, you're just not using the major muscle, the, the biggest muscles of your body. And two, like every single thing we do in CrossFit is that has that core to extremity principle and the posterior chain engagement, kind of one of the major checklists of, 
you know, what it means to be a functional movement. It's not just a checklist on the list of like defining characteristics. It's like, actually, if you want to get as fit as you possibly can, you need to learn to leverage the biggest movers in your body, which is your ass and your hamstrings. And we see it, we see it so frequently at the affiliate level, people who's, you know, my deadlift, my back hurts after deadlift day. And it, it's because we, well, we, we tried to use our quads and our low back instead of our ass and our hamstrings. And, um, if you can learn how to use your posterior chain with things like the five by five back squat, how well that's going to transfer to the positions you get into in your tempo pull clean. And then subsequently your one rep max clean is going to blow your mind. Um, but I don't know. We'll see if anybody does it. I doubt it. We'll just keep squatting <laughs> with our quads. What's a quad? All right. GPP snatching. Um, you just got done all the tempo pull snatching if you were in OS1. Um, we're still going to bias positions. So we're going to do some positional work, some volume work and go heavy. Um, the bench press, I actually went in and changed. Um, originally it was heavy bias, um, with volume and drop sets sprinkled in. I actually got rid of the drop sets based on the team misfit bench pressing that we've been doing the alternating back and forth between going super heavy and digging into volume um, has worked very well. And bench press is a weird, bench press is one of those things where you can have, truly have a program um, that change, completely changes your bench press in not that long of a period of time. And you can also have one that like, it doesn't do anything to. <laughs> you bench a bunch and you're like, what the fuck just happened? Um, this doesn't work very well. So the back and forth, kind of a nod to the Team Misfit programming, of heavy and volume. Um, basically you'll go in and you'll do, you know, your traditional waves where you're doing as many reps as you can at the heavier weight. Um, and then we jump into some, how many you, can you do at this percentage? And then we just basically go back and forth for the seven weeks. Um, and I was just inspired by, you know, if it's got efficacy across the board, um, for a lot of different athletes, then I know that it's going to work really well here with, with, you know, the Misfit Athletics crew. So I don't know if you guys have had the the same the same feeling about that phase, but I, I really I'll be like I'm I'm curious forth. to see how it pans out during retest next week. We'll retest yeah. it on Monday. Uh yeah. and see what we're bench three hundred. That's what's gonna happen. Yeah. Again. Did you do today's? Did you get your <laughs> No, nah, I mean, bench I, pressing? I, I had to cover this morning, so I haven't I haven't lifted yet, but I hit two seventy five for a double last week and I had room to grow there, so I feel like I'm feeling pretty good about it. Damn. But I, I, nice. that's like a weight I've never hit before, so it's working. I don't dare to talk to Sherb about this anymore because he told me to do 250 for five week one. And I was like, I don't know if we've met. Um, if you want to come to the gym, I can introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, You bro. did make me go heavier, though. I will that's give good. you that. Yeah, Tactic you work, made though. me go heavier than I wanted to, but I was just like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Tactic what did I do work. for the triple, though? The triple felt good. 250, 260, somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to read a session to you guys for the deadlift, and I want you to give... I'm going to need to take a fucking pen and paper out here. And a, and no, 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 no. You'll be fine. All right. Paint us a picture. Um, give some advice to different people. So we have deadlift speed work every 30 seconds for 10 sets. One speed pull deficit deadlift at 70%. The athlete's going to stand on a plate that's between one and three inches um, in terms of creating that deficit. Very serious here. If you have really poor mobility in your deadlift and in your pulling. Stand on a 30-inch box. <laughs> do Jefferson <laughs> curls with 70%. Yeah, yeah, um, either box. do no deficit or do the, the one-inch deficit. I love the deficit because we can really teach athletes to use their legs and not their arms and their fucking back like you can really learn how to do what we would call the earth press where people it finally clicks with someone that you're using your legs to stand this weight up um and then obviously carrying through to the speed so um instructions take the slack out of the bar before standing the weight up as fast as you can um extra credit here if you go nice and controlled on the way down but because it's every 30 seconds don't take six hours to do that so you guys as 
strong deadlifters have any advice for people when doing the speed work? Because if you just lollygag through this, eh, singles at 70, like it'll do something. You got to brace as hard as you can above and beyond what you think is necessary and pull the bar as fucking fast as you can off the ground once you have got tension in your hands and hamstrings. So get yourself uber tight, really work on bracing, like excessively brace more than you think is necessary. Pull yourself down into tension, taking all the slack out of the bar so it's not going to be jerked from the floor and then pull that fucking thing as fast as you can off the ground. That's all I got to say about that. Yeah, the pulling of tension out of the bar, I think, is super important because it makes it way less likely that you're gonna your ass is gonna shoot through the ceiling first, which is exactly what you want to avoid. I think the speed work is one of the most effective ways that we can get people stronger, and especially for athletes who, um, like the deadlift. The deadlift is a slow lift, uh, like by name, and just like when you one rep max, it's you're obviously not pushing against the ground slowly, but it happens. It occurs slowly. And especially for athletes who are naturally slower twitch, getting comfortable, 70% for those athletes might even be, might be heavy to do fast. But the magic there is getting the tension, getting the slack out of the bar so that you can push your feet into the ground as hard and as fast as you can. But the, the, the literal speed and power lifters, um, the I don't, I don't know how much it's used now. I'm also not super into the like powerlifting community, but they would use. I know Louis Simmons used to use, um, like a, I don't know what you might know what it's called, Drew, but it, it basically it basically measures bar speed. Um, you mm-hmm. can some some machine like you can some of them nowadays you can attach to a barbell and those when ones are lift, much more accurate than the like they tried to do those just, smart collars back in the day. Just wait a yeah, couple months. Yeah, the smart caller is what I'm thinking. And they'll solicit you for them. Just wait. Yeah, wait another month but it's or like we'll a, what whatever it is. It's like hey, I'm, we're measuring bar speed. You know, from yep. from start position to finish position. Like where how you know what's the speed of the bar, and when the speed drops below a certain threshold, your session's done. Obviously, most of us don't have access to that sort of technology, but it's a nod to the idea that like. We we you, it's literally like it's too it's too light for one rep at a time for a total of for a total of ten reps one rep at seventy percent is not enough to make adaptation like unless you're doing some wild shit like a slow tempo or whatever it's just not enough a traditional right. deadlift is not enough the the intent is so so important and pulling getting the tension so that you aren't suiting your ass up because if you obviously if you're doing it fast and wrong then we're just compounding problems but if the speed if you know the mechanics are there and you can apply the speed correctly that's it's such a good way to get so strong but the intent matters and the execution matters so like film yourself do do whatever you need to do to make sure you're doing it correctly but the speed works i love the speed work yeah, I actually got better at deadlifting um, by getting better at strict press. And That's what I used to. <laughs> fuck, did you just say to me? <clears throat> Hear That's me what out. I used to. It, it goes back to what Sherb said about about the bracing. So I was like, just like real pissed off about my my strict press because I like pressing is I'm definitely more of a, a presser than a puller. Um, so I dug into some of the like old articles about how to improve your pressing and the sentence was basically like you know how when you deadlift you squeeze the bar like you're trying to pulverize it even if it doesn't weigh anything and you're pulling yourself into tension like you're going to explode and you're so uncomfortable in the position with the bracing that you're in that you like almost have to stand the weight up and i was like no (laughs) yes Um, i know what you mean (laughs) um you need to do that in your strict press. So like the idea that our body is one muscle when you consider connective Mm -hmm. tissue and like you need to extend your knees as aggressively as you can, squeeze your butt as hard as you can, like really engage your midline and same thing, like try to break the bar. Like you're being like basically the biggest hardo ever with 95 pounds on the strict press. Um, But just that idea of understanding connective tissue and getting yourself into the positions that you need to, that's when speed work can work, right? Like you have to, in a way, pretend like you're doing something that you're not, right? 
Like you're trying to create the force production of a one rep max deadlift with 70% on the bar. And the only way to do that is to have the same intensity of muscle contraction that creates the speed that you need to have there. Um, so just that idea from the powerlifting community of, and, and you see it, even if you've only seen a few videos here and there on Instagram, they're crazy about their setup. The ways they fucking wiggle around and get themselves into certain positions and whatnot. Like you can tell that they bring a lot to a single lift, to like a single rep. So um, being able to really engage in a way that, you typically would have to for 90% plus um, to create the speed to have the force production is where you can really make some changes here. Um, last but not least, if you are on the strength bias track, you have five additional lifts. Um, those are hang power clean, strict press, power snatch, bench press, and meathead lunges. Um you guys have had the meathead sets for the curls, for the incline bench. You're getting the idea of, of how to do those. Um, if you live in a CrossFit wonderland and already have a safety squat bar, please use it. Um, if you think lunges suck in terms of your glutes and your hamstrings, wait till you put that safety squat bar on your back. Um, and then if you have the means to go out and buy one, it's a really incredible tool for keeping the bar in the kind of position that doesn't fuck with your mobility, but also forces the weight into your posterior chain. That's a weird thing to have. Because typically what we got to do is we got to take it back to, you know, MFT number one, 2012, when we were doing low bar back squat, um, no skill transfer, higher rate of injury, um, that sort of thing. You can get this sort of hybrid high bar but murder your posterior chain with the safety squat bar. Um, honestly, I haven't like looked back into it in a long time. I don't know how much these things cost. Um, I'm guessing they're probably like 200 bucks, something like that. Yeah, probably but a little more I than that. I couldn't tell you. But... Ours is a fucking relic. It, it is. still gets used. We, we actually had an athlete. <laughs> is it? 445 had an athlete. Uh... For real? Oh, how much yeah. does it weigh? That's oh, just the way they're 55 uh, like or 30? 65. You get the Titan 65? one for 300. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We had, I had an athlete do it yesterday. He couldn't, his wrist was bothering him. He couldn't clean front squat was probably out of the question. Probably could have back squatted, but for the exact reason that you said it basically, it's basically like a posterior chain front squat. It allows you to sit a little bit more upright. It replicates that kind of high bar back squat feel, but really, uh, just the way that it's balanced is, is pretty, is pretty unique and pretty cool. I think it's good for it's cool for anybody to mix yeah. in if they've got access to it. But um, yeah, really cool tool for those exact reasons. High bar back squat with a significant posterior chain requirement. You know, and then there's a lot of Metcons and intervals in bitch work. Um, what? That sounds and unsafe. They're short, medium, and long. They are cardio, gas, and muscle overload. They're couplets, they're triplets, they're AMRAPs, they're rounds for time. They're ascending ladders, they're descending ladders, there's chippers. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna take you through all of that because it is very traditional. But what I can say about it is the instructions for these guys when they were writing the Metcons were very much if it feels a little too complicated or a little bit too on the nose with what's the wildest thing they would do in the opener quarterfinals, we're gonna back off of it. And, you know, I'm looking at six rounds for time. 15 toes to bar, 20 slash 16 calorie C2 bike with the damper on five plus rest three minutes um, for six rounds. Simple and effective. Uh, that reminds me your in workout skill that we're going to be hammering is the toes to bar. Um, something that comes up every single fucking year at almost every level of competition. Um, we don't know why they're so obsessed with the same movements, but they are. They don't want to put Thank goodness. push ups. We need more deadlifts yeah, and toes set. to bar. Agreed. More mm -hmm. deadlifting and toes to bar. They just don't want to do handstand push ups. I don't I understand don't. why. I don't either. I do. It's the only thing I want to do. So <laughs> it doesn't really matter what they what they couple those with. 
All right, gentlemen, that is Hatchet Off Season 2. It begins Monday, June 17th at MisfitAthletics.com. If you just listen to all this and want to know what week one looks like, you can head to the program previews on Fitter. We'll make sure those links pop up somewhere. Emails, social media, all that stuff. Keep your eyes out. You can see the entire week laid out for you with the instructions that we referenced. We think it's really important to give you guys enough information to be able to succeed. We are making these subtle changes in the program for weaknesses. We got to make sure that we know what's coming. So you'll be able to see that week in advance at all times on Fitter. Really important that if you are joining the community that you head to discord.gg forward slash Misfit Athletics so that you can join our community. It's a really great place to um, compare scores, strategies, ask, you know, the FAQs get answered pretty quickly there um, by the people that have been following the program for a long time. All the coaches are in there. Um, and it's a good place to yuck it up with people. There's some, you know, friendly banter going back and forth as well. So if you guys are, are going to hop on the program for a new phase, make sure that you head to Discord as well. Any final thoughts, gentlemen? Start stacking days. Um, I'll just <laughs> you. Oh, go for what do you frozen. mean? Elaborate. I mean, Drew already just alluded to the fact that if you pick a certain track, strength track, or obviously, or the conditioning track, that you had the opportunity to do one more of those pieces every single day for the entire week, for the entire phase. Off season is now for you know ninety nine point nine percent of people. It's time to start stacking days, meaning. Get as many good reps in as you can between now and next season, and you'll be better prepared for the following season. But you just go in with the idea of checking boxes instead of stacking days, meaning just like getting into the gym and, all right, I'm supposed to do this, that, and the other, and you don't think about how you're moving or how, what you're doing. You're kind of just wasting your time, so don't do that. Um, yeah, my it was actually funny. Drew went to the last thing you said was going to be my final thoughts, and that was the, the instructions. Um when I open Fitter to do like remote coaching stuff, I oftentimes look and think to myself like, there's just too many fucking instructions here. And I don't have an answer to that. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, but they are, but they all do have a purpose. And especially like if you're, you're already paying for a program, you've got a whole shitload of them to choose from online, wherever, whatever you want. You can pick the one with the biggest name on it. You can pick the one, uh, the most effective one, which is ours. Um, but the idea is that like, there's a lot of instructions because this is not a one size fits all sport. This is not a one size fits all way to train in order to get better for a sport that is by its nature broad and inclusive um and the instructions tell you what to do and i think that like every once in a while i look through comments uh whether it's on like reddit or something that talk about programs and misfit athletics often gets the like it's too much or it's too complicated and it's to my response to that is like is pro is my my pessimistic response is you're a fucking idiot you don't read the instructions like you don't read the thing like yeah it looks like i'm looking at a day and i've got like 12 cells across the spread in the spreadsheet across my computer screen it's like yeah like objectively it is a lot and there are a lot of instructions and we do tell you provide a lot of guidance on how to do this shit but it takes one it takes you like 12 seconds to read through the instructions and two it's because they all have a purpose and the purpose is to make you as fit as possible using the program that has worked for a very long time that has sent you know countless athletes to the games that has sent you know we talked about page last week has sent page to the games six. how many times eight six times like there is a reason that it works whether or not you choose to how you know how well you choose to read the instructions and pay attention and execute just like anything you've ever done in life if you kind of half-ass the homework then you're going to half-ass the test and you're going to maybe understand the material if you actually dive in you actually read the instructions you try to you take an extra two or three minutes to try to actually understand all of a sudden like the gains that you make increase exponentially and it just becomes a big positive feedback loop so um I guess the final thought is to read the goddamn instructions, uh, but it's more and not more just like there's a lot going on here, but there's a reason for it. And it like we think that it works 
when it's executed as it's supposed to. I'm always just curious how many people are actually executing the program as it's supposed to be versus looking confused and just picking like the three things that they like to do and then saying the program was too hard. So, yeah, I think if you are, um, it's unnecessarily complicated if you are reading everyone else's instructions. So Hunter's Mm. referencing, like, if I go in and I see strength bias athletes perform lift one, lift two, and conditioning one, I can wrap my mind around that. Those are headers. It tells you what to do. But if you read the instructions for the strength bias athlete, the conditioning bias athlete, the open athlete, every single day, it starts to sound like gibberish. Um, And I think we always need... So this is a tool in marketing where you actually take... To kind of exactly what you just did, Hunter, where you take the criticism and you put it first, you call it out on your own, and then you say, but this is why. So it's the criticism would be, wow, this is, they're asking so much of me, but it works better than anything else if you buy in and you actually do it, right? And and yeah. that's something, that's the litmus test that we need. And what's really great is someone who's followed the program for a week or two or is program hopping and jumping in and out, they're not they're not um, the critics that we're going to go to. If we go on Discord and people that have been following the program forever are like, when did you guys start, it, start writing the program in French? Then we know that we have a problem, right? So we go to the people that are executing and digging in and the people that are climbing up the leaderboard year after year, whether it's in the open quarterfinals, semifinals, CrossFit games, because that's what happens when you execute on our program and and those are the people that we go to to figure out um you know sort of whether this is unnecessarily complicated or it's just like we need you to laser we need to make some decisions right now before june 17th what track are we doing what skills are we biasing and then the instructions are fucking cake because i know i'm going in and i'm finding conditioning bias that's what i'm doing skill okay i chose rope climb strict handstand push-ups and bar muscle ups those are the things that i'm going to execute on and that's when you can actually get to work um so i think that that's you know something where um we need the butt added to it we need the yeah. it is this add the butt. is more challenging we got to add the butt <laughs> add the butt more butt um, more butt sorry but it fucking works like that's that's butt kind of the <laughs> Sure. <laughs> you said it. I didn't say it. You said it. Now I'm trying to remember what my final <laughs> thoughts actually were. Get on what board. My final thoughts. Hmm. Get on board. Come on. Jump oh, in. Fuck. Oh, I know what my final thoughts were. Um, so in the last, in the off season one podcast, I had to battle, um, and this is company wide, and we're working on it. But we're a lot better at coaching than we are at selling programming. We're very good coaches. We're very good programmers. Like Ted's graphic design and videos and like the art of it. Like that's what we do. Those are our professions. In terms of the moving and shaking and fucking backdoor deals and Facebook ads or whatever the fuck. Like, you know, we're okay. We're working on it. Below so an off season average. one podcast, Hunter, two weeks before the program starts, actually one week in reality, is telling people not to follow off season one and to take time off. Um, and he wasn't necessarily wrong, um, but we're <laughs> literally trying to sell subscriptions. And honestly, it's kind of funny now because that's part of who we are. We're obsessed with the craft of what we do. That is the thing. Um, so if you did listen to Hunter and you did take you some time. You fucking idiots. <laughs> and you did take a We're little bit of Hunter. time off, you still have the opportunity for seven weeks of focused work to get yourself back in at what we would consider and some wouldn't consider a very manageable volume. Um, now would be the time to jump in. Now is the time like, okay, you took, you, you, you know, we talk, I'm talking to my athletes post semifinals about that CNS fatigue and that adrenaline dump and 
you take a week or two off and you feel pretty good. So you jump back in and then three or four weeks later, you're like, I think I quit. I don't want to do this anymore. So making sure that you're mindful of after some, you know, the big thing happened again, you know, taking some time to, to get yourself back into that place. But this program is still just like off season one written very much for the athlete that is getting back into it. Um, so if you did take a little bit of that time for yourself to, to, to get back on track, to have those nagging injuries go away and the CNS fatigue to, to, to sort of subside a little bit and you're ready to jump back in, um, this program is, you know, sort of the, of the simple and effective variety, um, or at least to us after talking Hunter, about Hunter, is your CNS recovered yet? Nah, I still need a little bit more time. <laughs> 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 yeah good all right gentlemen did we do it holding off yeah <laughs> yeah we did it thank you for tuning in to another episode of the misfit podcast misfitathletics.com monday june 17th hatchet off season two get started make sure you jump into discord make sure you get signed up make sure you check out that program preview um and yeah we'll see you Bye. next week